thank you. Well, welcome again to this, um, uh, this virtual launch event of, um, I think, yeah, people are fairly quiet, <laughs> to this virtual launch event of Bright Eyes by, uh, Bright Lies, I beg your pardon, I've made a mistake already, that's terrible, of, by A.A. A. Abbott. Uh, I'm your host, Michael McMahon. This evening, we're very lucky because in addition to A.A. herself, who is going to talk about the book and is going to do the readings of the book, in addition, we've got two other panelists who are experts in fields that are very specific to uh, the plot of this book. And you will learn shortly in what way they are. Um, they are Prudence Thomas and Marie Wright. So welcome, Prudence. Welcome, Marie. Um, and so I'm going to begin, first of all, some housekeeping matters. Um, could you please, if you have questions as we go through, type them in the chat box, because that's the only way we can handle it in a practical way. We're going to allow 15 minutes for Q&A at the end, so please type your questions in the chat box. We will retrieve them at, the, at, at say, quarter to nine from the chat box, and we will answer as many as we can, and hopefully we will finish on the dot of 9 p.m. So, uh, with that done, can I please say welcome to A.A. Abbott, our author this evening. A.A., please tell us a little bit about the book, Bright Lies, and then get, set the scene and do a little reading from it. Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for coming along to the launch of Bright Lies. Um, I'm A.A. Abbott. My real name is Helen Blakingsoff, but it's not right at the start of the alphabet, so A.A. Abbott is my pen name. And Bright Lies is my eighth book, but it's my first psychological thriller and it's much darker than the relatively frothy, light, vodka business-based crime thrillers I've written before. And it begins with Emily, a 12-year-old star-struck girl who loves art, being given the opportunity to go to an art exhibition in Bath. She's very young, She's naive, um, and when she meets the artist, a handsome young man, there's an immediate spark between them. Now, what Emily experiences is a crush, nothing more than that, but David, the artist, is somebody who ultimately exploits that crush. And the book is all about how Emily is taken in by David the bright lies are the lies that he tells her and her mother to get them on side. And when she eventually realises what's been happening to her and escapes, she has to run for her life to break free of David because he's desperate to silence her. Could I do a short reading right from the beginning? Absolutely. Emily meets David. Okay, so Emily's gone to an art exhibition in Bath. She's 12 years old. Her best friend has won a competition to have her portrait painted. And they're both invited to an exhibition where the friend's portrait and various others of women and girls are displayed around the walls. And Emily somehow ends up talking to the artist when she hadn't expected to. As he gazes at me expectantly, I finally managed to speak. He learnt about the pre-Raphaelites at school. Romantic realism. The words emerge as a stammer, but once I start talking, it becomes easier. I love art. It's the only subject I'm good at. Me too. My teachers despaired of me. What sort of stuff do you paint? Whatever we're told to do in class, I think, but I don't say. I'm working on a still life at school, apples and oranges, acrylic on canvas. There must be a million such paintings in the world already, but still, I know mum will give it pride of place in our tiny living room. That's a great start. I'm thinking of switching to acrylics, but these are oils, as you can see. They're awesome, I say timidly, knowing instinctively why his work is so expensive. There is joy, light and movement in the images. They are better versions of their subjects. 
I wish mum had entered me for the competition. His face lights up at my praise. The resemblance to Liam is amazing. He looks so young that the girl can't be his daughter. Thank you. I'm thrilled that someone's actually buying them. You all know that as a creative person yourself, you seek validation for your work, but you're never certain you'll get it. I nod out of my depth. Mum loves everything I produce. Our fridge is covered with my drawings. You see the little red dots next to three of my paintings. That means I've sold them. Anyway, best of luck with your endeavours. I hope your mum and dad encourage you. Dad's dead. Mum likes art though. That's her, there. She's standing with her back to us, accepting more wine from Mrs. Harris, who is on her second. I hope she is remembered she's driving. The artist raises an eyebrow. Your mother? I thought you were sisters. Mum spins round, smiling. Flattery will get you everywhere. She wouldn't normally say something like that. Her cheeks are pinker than usual. It must be the wine. Thank you, AA. Um, and it's interesting the way that straight away we see the kind of how, how cleverly David, the artist, has um, established that Emily's mum is a single parent and flattered her as well. Um, and um, that brings me on to, we're going to have another reading from AA uh, in, in, in a few minutes. But before that, I've got questions for um, our other panelists here and uh, Prudence and Marie. And I, I trust you'll forgive me because we've got, I've got quite a lot of questions. I need to use a crib sheet. So I'm going to begin with you, Prudence. And the first question is the shortest, but <laughs> not the easiest. Could you introduce yourself in two sentences? No pressure. <laughs> sure. So uh, I'm Prudence S. Thomas. I'm a forensic psychologist and a writer from the West Midlands. Thank you, that was fantastic, two sentences. Now, forensic psychology is a popular topic uh, these days for many movies and TV shows. And the accuracy varies, and sometimes it leads to misconceptions about this area of psychology. How would you define the field of forensic psychology and the role it plays? Yeah, so it's never quite as exciting as it seems to be on TV or in books. Um, so general media portrayals tend to be things like Cracker and um, the profiling side of things, which is a very, very small area of forensic psychology it is there, but there's probably three or four people in the country in the UK who are profilers full time. So the majority of our work in forensic psychology, forensic meaning related to the law and legalities. So majority of our work is with offenders. So working with people in prisons, in forensic mental health services, working in offender, risk, um, offender rehabilitation, working around risk assessment, and also providing expert opinion to the courts um, as well. So it's, it's quite a broad field really. And the other bit that gets forgotten a lot is working with the victims of crime as well. That also falls within the remit of uh, forensic psychologists. Okay, thank you, thank you. Well, talking about specific shows, what do you think of, of the way shows like Criminal Minds or Law and Order portray forensic psychology? Um, they're very often tremendous fun, um, but nothing like what the actual day job is. Um, so I do much more paperwork than anyone does in a TV program and um, spend much more time sitting talking to people about their lives so the majority of what I do is is helping people and trying to um, trying to make the world safer essentially by reducing the risk of people re-offending and helping people to find better ways of living their lives. Um, usually we're working after the fact so we're usually working after people have been to court um, or at least after they've been apprehended for an offence so it's much less of the investigation and much more of the putting together of the puzzle afterwards about why have people arrived at this point in the first place. Okay, thank you, thank you. Now, I understand that your work involves dealing with psychopaths. How is psychopathy diagnosed and how does it differ from other uh, 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 personality disorders like narcissistic perso personality disorder or sociopathy? 
So psychopathy and personality disorder are really controversial diagnoses. So um, there's a lot of disagreement in the field about how helpful and how valid the diagnoses are. Um, but generally speaking, in terms of how we diagnose, it's the same for all kind of diagnoses, really. You would take a history. Um, so you'd find out as much as you can about the person. You'd look through court reports if they've been in trouble before. Um, you'd get information from family, from medical reports to get as best a picture as you can about how this person's life has unfolded. Um, so you'd get all of that information. So the file information, uh, what we'd call collateral interviews, interviews with people around the person. And then you'd interview the person themselves. Um, and you use all of this information to decide then whether the person fulfills the criteria in one of the diagnostic systems um, to understand whether they, they might fulfill a criteria for a particular diagnosis or not. Um, there's a lot of crossover between diagnoses as well, so it can make it really hard for clinicians, doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists to agree sometimes on what you might be seeing um, and whether a person's behaviour is better explained by psychopathy or narcissistic personality disorder or antisocial personality disorder. These are all things that have quite a lot of crossover. So it's a really controversial area in the field. Okay, okay. So what you're saying is uh, to, to cover that and get finished by nine is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask you a couple more questions and then probably I'll switch to Marie because I don't want to run out of time and, and not have any questions to Marie. Um, here's a tricky one. How do you deal with working with people who have in some cases done terrible things? Mm -hmm. Um, I think the most important thing for me is something I was saying to AA about the other day, which is when I was, when I was a little girl, my mum would always, when we'd see people who were homeless, I would always get really upset about it when I was, when I was a kid. And she'd always say to me, when you look at that person, remember that once they were a baby and they came into the world with all of that promise and all of that innocence. And so whenever I'm working with someone, I, even if they've done something terrible, I remember that at one point they were a baby, they were a child, and it's the things that have happened to them that have contributed to how they've arrived where they are now. So that just helps to hold a bit of a sense of the fact that people aren't monsters. People are people. And that's why people are terrible very often. Terrible things that people do are people being people. Um, but it's important to hold in mind the compassion for the person in front of you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Good answer. Um, do you believe psychopaths can be re rehabilitated? Now, of course, you've talked about how you, how you consider it and based on how, what you were taught by your very wise mother. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think most people can change. And um, if, yeah, most people can change. Some people will need a lot more time, a lot more input to help them to change. Um, but I would say the majority of people can make a difference to how they behave. Um, some people are always going to need external controls, people watching over them, people managing what they're doing, um, which will fall into some of Murray's sort of line of work. Um, but I, I I've met very few people who aren't capable of some sort of change. Thank you. Thank you. And are all psychopaths dangerous? <laughs> um, no, I think like anything else, it's a spectrum. And there are many people who are very successful who harness some of the traits of psychopathy, like not having much regard for um, other people's feelings being able to be uh, somewhat manipulative and superficially charming to be very successful in the world and to be very successful business people, for example, um, and politicians. Um, so we will be amongst people with degrees of psychopathy on a day to day um, in our day to day life, essentially, sometimes our bosses, um, sometimes our members of parliament, <laughs> leaders. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. 
you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more question for you. I've got some more questions, but I'm going to then move over to Marie. Um, in this book, in Bright Lines, David, the artist, is highly deceptive and manipulative. And we've seen a little bit of a sample of that in that uh, reading in the, at the art exhibition mm -hmm. where he gets the mother on his side. Um, do you think he qualifies as a psychopath just based on what you've read? Because you've read the book. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it, if he was a real person, it'd be quite likely that he might meet the criteria both for psychopathy and for narcissistic personality disorder. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks for that, uh, Prudence. We'll give you a rest now. And, uh, and Marie, I've got some questions for you. And I'm going to come back to you, though, Prudence. Um, no, I'm sorry, but I have, I have one more question that I will ask you right at the end, Prudence, and that is, you're also a writer, and you write fantasy, don't you? So I'd like to tell you, you to tell us a little bit about your books. But first of all, I'm going to move over to Marie. Um, and Marie, could you please, same challenge as <laughs> for Prudence, um, describe yourself, introduce yourself. Two, what? In, in two sentences, no pressure. <laughs> Um, hello everybody, um, my name is um, Mary and I'm an ex-police detective superintendent uh, from Avon and Somerset Police, so I live between Bath and Bristol, so really helpful for where the book's based. Okay, thank you. That was too. I, I got distracted there. Somebody speaking. But okay, somebody. Thank you, everyone, because all of you have muted yourself. So can you just plug into your pen? Okay, could you please, if you're not already muted, mute yourself. Right, thank you. Marie, first question then, apart from introducing yourself, was how does dealing with young victims of abuse differ from the way you'd handle cases involving adults? Um, I think it's important to, most of the time, with young victims, um, they will be children, so they'll be under 18. So a lot of the time, they won't know the difference between right and wrong which um, you can see at the start of the book with Emily's, Emily's behaviour, the fact she's only 12. So really it takes a lot of time to build trust and confidence in children more than adults, because quite often, you know, they've had some sort of power control over them about keeping a secret or something's gonna happen. And you've got to try and overcome whatever that hold is from the offender. And that's normally about spending a lot of time with them, telling them they haven't done anything wrong and gaining trust and confidence. So, a lot more time than you would with an adult. Okay, thank you, thank you. And I believe that quite a lot of your work was involving child abuse, wasn't it? Yeah, I worked in child protection for quite a long time, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, the book, Bright Lights, uh, shows the difficulty that the, the police forces have in dealing with cases of abuse. What would you say are some of the biggest challenges facing police forces in these types of cases? Um, I think a lot of the time is actually getting disclosures from young children because I think we've seen in this book that there is that blurring with relationships and sometimes they think it's their boyfriend as opposed to, you know, I'm talking about a girl. Um, you know, we mustn't forget that boys get abused as well. That's really important. Yeah. Um, but there's that blurring of relationships and particularly when they haven't had healthy relationships when they've been growing up, they don't understand that it is abuse. Um, so quite often, you know, you have to get that trust and confidence that we just talked about. But also with police forces at the moment, you know, there's a difficulty in resources that we hear all the time on the media. And I think offenders are getting very clever, particularly if they offend like across boundaries across police forces. Because sadly, police forces aren't very good at talking to each other. So you get a travelling offender, you know, that makes it even more difficult to, you know, identify that behaviour and identify a pattern quickly. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> tricky one, this. What are your views on David? Okay, you, you've read the book uh, and, and people who, who logged on to this event haven't read the whole book, they've heard a little bit of a reading there. What are your views on David? And he, in the book, he abuses Emily through isolation and controlling behaviour. Would you say that pattern of behaviour is typical or you see it quite often with offenders? Um, yep, yeah, sadly, um, in my experience, you see men like David, who were really quite clever, uh, quite manipulative, yeah, yeah. Um, and basically they are looking for single women that have children that they can abuse. So I think AA's written this really well on the fact that even though David actually becomes a paedophile, 
he isn't your obvious sex offender. As you see at the beginning of the book, Emily thinks he looks like something out of One Direction. She's got a crush on him. And basically at the beginning of the book, he's just a normal guy. And sadly, as Prudence will probably agree with me, a lot of sexual offenders are normal people. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I've got to ask you one more question, and then, and then we're going to lighten the tone by bringing in another character from the okay. book. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Because um, it's not all black, by the way. Um, yeah, a final question in this part, uh, Marie. Um, are there warning signs that we should look out for if we suspect ourselves or someone we know is suffering abuse or domestic violence? Um, yeah, there are, and I think there's a lot of obvious signs that you know, that most people know, um, particularly with children with sexual abuse at an early age, you get bed wet wetting, you get sexualized behavior at school, you know, teachers and social workers, all those people on the lookout for those sort of um, behaviors. But also with domestic abuse, you have the obvious behavior, you know, um, clues like injuries. But I think now, you, you know, there's, there's cleverer types of abuse, which is very sad, more like emotional, physical abuse, which aren't it easy to spot you know and people have got control of someone's life of their money of how they dress what they do um so it's you know there's a whole range of sadly of different abuses um and you know some are obvious and some sad, sadly aren't okay thank you thank you um right well as i said i, I, I promised we're going to lighten the tone a little bit <laughs> and ask aa to do her second reading, her final reading from the book, and this is introducing a different character, um, and uh, not just a different character, but a very different scenario. A.A., do you want to set the scene and then give us a couple of minutes, please? And thank you, meanwhile, to Marie. Sure. Um, thanks very much, Michael, and thanks, Emily, for making this so great so far. Um, the book is primarily about Emily, but there is another character who's really important, and that is Jack, a DJ in Birmingham. And the section I'm going to read now is about something that happens when Jack has just arrived in Birmingham. So he isn't a DJ yet. Um, he's somebody who's a bit rootless. He's ended up in a squat in Birmingham. He's 19 years old. He's desperate for money. And after doing a bit of busking, he's caught the attention of a local nightclub owner who's hosting an Elvis competition. Both the nightclub owner and Jack rather dislike Elvis, but they both realise that Elvis is a way to make a bit of money. In the case of the nightclub owner, he's using his nightclub on a quiet night to host an Elvis competition. And in the case of Jack, if he wins it, he'll earn some money, and that means he will eat tonight. So Jack is highly motivated to do well in the Elvis competition. Ray retrieves his mic. Hello, Birmingham, he announces in a broad local accent. Introducing the ravers tonight, we have Eddie Ecstasy. The drummer beats out a frenzied rhythm for 10 seconds. Ray waits a moment to let the audience show their appreciation before asking bass player Pete Paranoid and lead guitar Jazzman John to display their skills. And I'm Ray, he shouts to more cheers. Who else do you want to see on stage? Elvis! The audience yells as one. I've got the next best thing. It's Trevor Harper from Lower Gornal. There's a rousing chant of Trevor, 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 as he takes the stage, lyrics glittering in the spotlight. What are you singing for us, Trevor? Ray asks. Love me tender, Trevor replies. The audience hollers its approval as the band starts to play. Trevor murders it. He has the moves off pat, the clothes, hair and sideburns, but he just can't sing. Jack gawps at him, unsure whether to be embarrassed for his new friend or merely sympathetic. As Trevor finishes, he roars, yeah, in the hope that others will join in. He needn't have worried. Every singer is greeted with rapturous applause, although they're uniformly terrible. 
Nicky, the black Elvis from Edgbaston, begins blue suede shoes. Jack glances over at Cassie and Liv. Their expressions are bored. Cassie catches his eye. You're next, she mouths. Jack sidles up to the stage, jumping onto it as Nicky makes his exit. Next up, a foreigner, Jack Dibble from Bristol, Ray announces. Jack Biddle. Nobody hears the correction because Ray hasn't let go of the microphone yet. Jack reaches for it, clocking Cassie's surprised face as he tells the Ravers to play Heartbreak Hotel. She still wears a look of astonishment when he finishes three minutes later. As he returns to the vicinity of the bar, she beckons him over. Sit down. Cassie pats the unused chair next to her. You are actually good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, and clearly you're bilingual here, um, AA. And the book is set, I'm a right, in partly around Bristol and Bath, and partly in Birmingham, because you've got, you have a foot in both camps, don't you? Yes, that's right. So I, I live in Bristol now, but I lived in Birmingham for many years. Uh, and still really, really love it. Uh, and I was working there up until the pandemic and lockdown hit in March. Okay. So they're two cities that I know well. And obviously everybody in Bristol knows Bath. Mm -hmm. I've got a little neighbour to discuss. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Anyway, right now, thank you. Uh, like, like, as I promised everyone, that's why I determined a little bit. Um, and I'll come back, by the way, the, the scenes in the nightclub where Jack gets his chance to impress everybody with his Elvis impersonations, they're, they're very realistic, they really are. And I just don't want to ask you some questions later on, A.A., eh, about your research processes, because clearly they've been very thorough for this book. But I want to come back, please, because I've still got some questions for, um, for Prudence and Marie and I'm not going to let you off the hook yet so so going back first to Prudence I've just got a couple more here um wh what is following on from the questions that, that I had before um what is the process of carrying out a clinical assessment yeah so um whenever I first meet someone that I'm working with um I will usually have been given a bundle of information. So usually it'll be the Crown Prosecution Service paperwork, which will have witness statements, um, information from the court police, um, interview statements, things like that. So I'll have worked through those um, and got a sense of what the issue is for the person before me. Um, I will, like I was saying earlier, have gathered as much information as I can. So very often it's a bit of a, um, it's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. I'll have to do some digging with different services, different systems to get as much information as I can. Um, and once I've got as much of a history as I can, then I will sit and interview the person. And depending on what I'm interviewing them for, uh, sometimes if I'm doing a parole report, I'll basically spend the entire day with someone. So we'll do a two or three hour interview in the morning, have a lunch break, and then I'll interview with them for two or three hours in the afternoon. And I'll work through in a lot of detail their childhood, their history at school, a violent history, sexual history, relationship history, family history, all of these sorts of things. That's so a really extensive, quite intrusive, to be honest, um, interview uh, to, to get a picture for someone. Um, and then I get the fun of writing that up essentially into quite an extensive report usually. So, <laughs> so it's um, part fascinating um, journey through someone's history and their experiences and part admin, really. But the, the, part, the, the, the interviews themselves, as long as they were, you know, uh, that's challenging work, is it not? Yeah, yeah it's, it's challenging. It's challenging for me, but it's also challenging for the person on the receiving end. And I have to say, Really, most of the time, people will be very polite and respectful when I'm interviewing them, um, to an extent that people would probably find surprising when I'm asking them questions that are really intrusive and difficult very often when I'm meeting them for the first time. Mm. Good for you. Well, you've, well you, you show some empathy in what you do, which is, uh, which is very nice and impressive. And uh, by the way, just 
change the subject here. Um, AA, you'll be happy to know. People have put a couple. There've been a couple of messages in the chat box saying, "Really enjoyed the reading. Delivered very well." Okay, right, I've got final question for you, Prudence, and then you can relax. Oh no, no, <laughs> then I'm going to talk about your books. Okay, <laughs> how is the information you gather used in court? Well, the other one was actually part. The, the subset of that is: Have you been involved in criminal criminal court proceedings? the answer will be yes. Yeah, yeah, in, in all sorts of different ways um, and different types of courts as well. So forensic psychologists are involved in all sorts of different things. Family courts, um, we might be asked to be expert witnesses in family courts for decisions around um, taking children into care, for example. Um, we might be asked whether someone's fit to enter a plea if they're mentally unwell. Um, or we might be asked to give an opinion on people's risk. So all of those sorts of things fall within our, our general work. And like any other expert witness, we present the information to help people make a decision. So to help the parole panel or um, the judge or whoever it is, magistrates, wherever you happen to be, um, to make their decision essentially. So we, we pull the information together and present it um, to help people make a decision about, most often around risk in one way or another. Thank you. Thank you. Well, final question. You're also a writer. Yes. What kind of novels do you write and where can people find information about them? <laughs> um, so I write um, fantasy uh, mysteries and uh, it makes a bit of a change from my day job. They're set in the 17th century, um, so it makes a change from the, the interesting but slightly grim day to day. Um, and you can find them on Amazon. Um, yeah, they're, they're called the Cunning Fake Mysteries, and they're a bit like Cadfile, if people remember Cadfile, but with magic. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's how I describe them. Okay, and your pen name is Prudence S. Thomas. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And hopefully, um, uh, our colleague Donna, who is managing the chat box, uh, Connor, if you, Donna, if, you, if, you, if you've got a link actually to uh, Prudence's books, if you could put it there, that'd be fantastic. If you haven't got it handy, okay, we'll put it on later. Thank you. Uh, thank you ever so much, Prudence. Um, Thanks, uh, and so, Marie, I've got a couple more questions for you now, actually. Um, just two or three. Um, and, and that is, first of all, it's a more general thing, this actually, not specific to you know, just only your work. As a country, we're starting to pay more attention to domestic violence, domestic abuse, uh, and we passed the domestic abuse bill earlier this year and services such as the Paladin National Stalking Advocacy, support, which supports victims. How do you think, will this change how the police and courts deal with abuse cases and in what way? Um, well, I think all these things are really great. And I think the more attention that the media gives or that the courts give or that the government gives to these really sad areas of child abuse and sexual abuse, the better. Uh, in my opinion, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, having been to court cases, um, a lot of the time that's where the investigation falls down. I think there could be more sympathetic courts where basically the victim doesn't have to see the offender. Uh, more cross-examination by video, which I know a lot of court, uh, courts are going to do, and that is um, part of the government's um, plan to have um, court evidence given by video. So victims don't even have to come to court because quite often you can have a screen but if you're going in and out of the court you sometimes you'll bump into the offender which um, is really not great and doesn't need to happen in 2020. Um, the other things that we can do is there's national schemes like um, Claire's Law which is about domestic abuse in the fact that if you suspect a partner being involved in domestic abuse or you just want to know when you meet somebody new like Emily's mum meeting David you can make a, you know, an inquiry with the police to find out if that person has got any, um, you know, any, any past history of domestic abuse. Likewise for child abuse, where a lot of people remember the Sarah Payne murder. Um, again, that is uh, a request that, again, you can go to any police force if you have any suspicions or even if you just, you know, you just want to know whether, you know, your new boyfriend, your new partner has had any involvement in child sexual abuse. Those are two schemes that are offered nationally. Every police force does it across the country. Sadly, it's not taken up very well. Um, so it's a bit of a plea for me 
uh, for anybody that's listening, that, that is available to everybody. Okay, thank you. Well, I, when, I, when I read the book, I was, uh, yes, uh, both Emily's mother and grandmother actually have made those inquiries of the police because they, uh, I don't know whether they suspected David or it was just maybe for them a routine, uh, uh, a routine thing. Uh, when he first started dating Emily's mother, they both in, made inquiries with the police, but he had no record, so nothing came out of it. But it was it. That was interesting part to read, actually. Um, I had a final question for you, Murray. Um, and by the way, on the on the question, this question of domestic abuse, I um, I'm wearing a T-shirt which you can't see actually. And <laughs> if I walk back, you can see it. This is um, uh, AA. These come from a charity, do they not? A national charity. And this is men taking action. Um, against violence towards women and uh, it's from a national charity um, uh, which we are uh, hoping to raise awareness of. So um, I've got a final question for you Mari, um, apart from asking you about your reading habits. <laughs> in the book, in Bright Lies, Jack comes from a broken home and he's also witnessed horrific violence in his own family. Okay. And that's had a huge negative impact on his own behavior. Would you say this is common for children who suffered in this way? Um, in my experience, yes, I would. Um, sadly, that goes back to healthy relationships and all behavior. So if it's very important for children growing up, and probably prudence will agree with me as a psychologist, because I'm not as clever as she is. Um, if they haven't got normal relationships or healthy boundaries, um, then that's all they know. So if, if they see like mum and dad hitting each other or, you know, no boundaries about behaviour, then that's what they think is normal. And it's not until someone actually says no, because as we all know, it's much easier being a friend than a parent, isn't it? Um, you know, that's, that's how they grow up, sadly. And until they meet someone, um, and you see that in the book as well, where they actually realise that, you know, that relationship isn't normal, those things shouldn't happen, that's when they suddenly realise, you know, and when they grow old, of course, to understand issues that, you know, that are normal, if you like, um, you know, that's when actually the penny drops. So sadly, yes, it is quite common. Okay, thank you, thank you. Now, you said at the start you were a detective superintendent. Yeah. Uh, now you're retired, but I know you're also an avid reader. Uh, what kinds of books do you like to read? Uh, apart from Bright Lies, are there any others that you'd like to recommend? <laughs> well, I'm not as clever as my colleagues on the line. I haven't written any books, sadly, but I do like reading. Um, I try not to read too many police dramas because I've had quite a lot of stuff in the place, as you can imagine. But I really enjoy Bright Lies and I'm looking forward to reading the whole of the Bright Trail as well. I've got my own Prudence's books, they look interesting, so I'm going to have a look at those. Um, I also like autobiographies, so I like um, Michelle Obama's books very good, and I'm hoping to get the, uh, the autobiography of the uh, Prime Minister of New Zealand for Christmas. Hopefully my husband will hear me, so he'll, he'll give me that as well. And then I like some, you know, some really easy stuff, like Jodie Piku and uh, the lady from Australia that did um, Pretty Little Lives, Leanne Moriarty, I like her as well. So, I brought it back to me. <laughs> thank you. Okay, right. Thank you. Murray, you can just relax now. Yeah. And I've got a final <laughs> questions for AA before we throw this open to, uh, to, to Q&A. Um, AA, can you tell us, you mentioned a little bit about it at the beginning, but would you like to expand a little bit more on the title? I, I think it's a great title. Can you tell us why? Bright Lies. Yeah, so it's about the bright lies that David tells, but it's also a bit of a play on words, I guess, because Emily flees from a sunset village and ends up in the big city of Birmingham with its bright lights and its yeah, yeah. clubbing scene. Yes. Yeah, yeah okay. Well, I, I, I wrongly called it bright eyes to begin with, didn't I, really? So, I was thinking, I, <laughs> we need to have a soundtrack for that. Um, and how can we get hold of the book? Well, you mentioned Amazon, yeah? Yes, it's available on Amazon and it's available in lots of different formats. So you, you can get the ebook on Amazon. Um, yeah. It's in something called Kindle Limited as well, which is like uh, an Amazon subscription library. People pay a certain amount per month and then they can borrow as many books as they like. 
Oh, yeah. I was in that. Um, then there were various paperback versions, um, which Amazon sells, and which you can order from bookshops. If a bookshop's got it, great. If it hasn't, it's be able to order it. There's a sort of standard okay. of paperback. Well, you've answered what was going to be my next question. Is it also available in what we call bricks and mortar bookstores? So you're saying yes. So in other words, and they don't stock Amazon books, obviously. Um, they throw you out the door if you mention the dreaded name. So, so presumably you've got a non-Amazon edition as well. Yeah, it's distributed by Ingram, who are one of the biggest printers and distributors in the world and yeah. printed okay. in the UK. Um, I'll just explain, there's a large print version as well, with a large print sticker. Oh, that should be. Something called a dyslexia-friendly edition, and that's got a very, very easy reading print style. I don't know if you can see that, but it's a sensory font with loads of space. Very easy to print. Yeah. Hello, hello. Uh, Almost all of you are mute. Ah, thank you. Well done. <laughs> that person views themselves. Um, okay. Um, and I was going to ask, how's the book doing? But you told me at the beginning, you're just, you've just overtaken Richard Osman. Well, <laughs> yeah, the book's overtaken Richard Osman. In, in the Amazon. Hot new releases, which I'm really excited about. <laughs> well done. Well done. You. I mean, um, it's such a fantastic book. I, I, I can't stress it enough. Obviously, I would say that about my own work, uh, no. but it's had so many good reviews already, uh, and no. they're from strangers, so I know that they're good reviews. <laughs> reviews that you can rely on. Well, I can add to those reviews because um, I'm a slow reader, but I read it really, really quickly. It was very compelling, great plot, and uh, and and very convincing. Um, I'm going to, I, I might come back at the end if we've got time after the Q&A, but it's a quarter two now, so I want to throw it open, and then if we've got a couple of minutes at the end, AA, I'll let you wrap up the evening. But, um, right, now Donna has kindly uh, compiled all the, the questions here, so I'm going to, um, going to, do, 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 fine, fine, fine. Right. Okay. Did you struggle? This is from Rosalind. Did you struggle to avoid displaying David's successful techniques in case of? Did you struggle? In other words, was it was it difficult to do to avoid displaying his successful techniques in case of informing potential copycats? David's techniques, unfortunately, are depressingly familiar, uh, and. Right. Uh, I think Mary will echo that. Uh, he, he doesn't do anything that thousands of other abusers haven't done in the past. Uh, yeah. he, he uses treats and secrets. So he plies Emily with alcohol. They do drugs together. She's got to keep it a secret from her mum. And then gradually she's got more and more secrets. And yeah. he moves in for the kill. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, you, you, maybe you, Mary would like to say something about that, even though we let her off the hook earlier. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. I think it goes back to what I said originally. It's about that power control. And if you're doing it against a child, you know, she, she thinks he's really in pain in one direction to start with. So <clears throat> she already fancies him like a crash, like you know, AA said. Um, and it's the alcohol, you know, <clears throat> it's the MAC makeup. You know, it's all the, the treats that she wouldn't have normally. Um, so and then she sees him as a boyfriend. Then all of a sudden, you know, when people say, oh, how's your stepdad? She realized, oh, it's not my boyfriend. But then, you know, she, it, goes, it goes too far. So, but, but sadly, you know, like AA says, it is, you know, I don't think anybody would read it and say, well, I'm going to do that because people are already doing it. Um, exactly as you know, A has written. Okay, thank you, thank you. And by the way, we've got a couple of excellent. We've got several qu uh, points here that are not questions that people just simply say, "Yeah, I've got the book on my Kindle, enjoying it, etc., etc." 
somebody has, is, is logged on from Kelso up in Scotland there, and somebody else said, very important question is, where do we gather if there's a fire alarm? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mary, I'll throw that over to you, as you, <laughs> as you were a police officer. Okay. Um, right, 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 right. This is, yeah, so much. Yeah, uh, somebody here, Faye, says, I thought the title had more to do with the, I don't know if the pr correct pronunciation here, A, with the Bobola moth, because there, uh, there is this very Birmingham phrase that comes up quite a lot, and it's a kind of a moth, and it's moths being drawn to the light, mm -hmm. uh, and fragility of moths, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and, but the person does add, and this is Faye, Oh, and I did enjoy the read, even though it was a harrowing topic. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much for that feedback, Faye and Michael. Um, and it, I, I think Faye is right. Um, David and Emily are drawn to each other like moths to a flame. Um, but as Mary has pointed out, there's a big disparity in power between them. You've got a 12-year-old girl who knows nothing. Um, and you've got a 30 year old man who knows a great deal uh, and yeah. who shouldn't do what he does. This came out, didn't you think, because one of your reviewers did say, uh, was very critical of Emily, uh, almost forgetting that she was 12 years old when it started. Yeah, yeah. A, a couple yeah. of them have been. A couple yeah. of them have said she's selfish, she's manipulative. She's a 12 year old girl, she's a kid. You know, uh, nobody says that teenagers are sweetness and light, but they still deserve not to be seduced when they're just kids. Yeah, exactly. And he's a 30 year old man of the world who, as it turns out in the book, as well as being an artist, also through a legacy is quite well off as well. So in other words, he's able to give you a sort of a treat. A question here from Connor. What made you decide to write a much darker book this time around? That's a really interesting question, Connor. Um, and I don't know whether you'd believe the answer, but the idea came from a dream, and it was a dream that I had a really long time ago, so um, way before I wrote any of my other books, um, way before I was capable of writing a novel. Uh, and I, I kind of set all my early ideas to one side and, and didn't do anything with them for years. Uh, and then I was talking to my grown-up son who never reads my books because um, he's the kind of person who would read Prudence's books. He really loves fantasy uh, and sci-fi and it does not read thrillers. And I was telling him about this and he said, I'd actually read that. Uh, and that made me decide that I would write it. But it's not as dark as the original concept. I mean, yeah. it's a task over that because the, the original concept is a lot darker. But I think it is a better book than the original idea. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So a couple of messages here saying, well done overtaking Richard Osman. Um, thanks for that question, Donna. Oh, Donna also asks, is there a system, talking about your other books, is there a system to reading the books? Can you read them in any order? Or, or would there be one that she should read first? The, the trail series are a series of five um, and read in order, starting with the bride's trail. They don't have to be because each story stands on its own, but if you follow the characters from book one through to book five, you see them develop as people. Uh, and in particular, there's a character called Kat, who's a party girl and a drifter in the bride's trail. And readers tend not to like her, and I probably would regard her as a waste of space and a, a bit too fluffy if I met her down at the cocktail bar myself. But by the end of the trail series, uh, by the final trail, book five, she has turned her life around and, and she wins readers over and they realise that actually um, there is more to her that, than just a party girl fitting from bar to bar and man to man. Thank you. Thank you. And by the way, Connor, who asked that previous question, Connor, not Donna, I'm easily confused, clearly. Um, it, uh, also, Connor said somewhere, um, just finished the book today, loved it. Um, and somebody else, uh, Mandy Rose, says it's such a good book, I could not put it down. So that's nice. That's nice to know, provided Mandy Rose isn't your sister-in-law, by the way. Um, 
<laughs> no, Manti Rose is not my sister-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Manti Rose, and thank you, Connor. Uh, Connor's not related to me either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and somebody says, oh, the Kindle version just appeared in my library. That's good to know. Okay, listen, we've got five minutes before we, before, uh, uh, we get kicked off by Zoom. Well, we won't get kicked off, actually. We'll, we'll kick ourselves off, actually. Um, now, I, I had a question about the book's title. You've answered that. How's the book doing? Fine, fine, fine. Uh, done all that. Let me see. Oh, yes, I know what it was. Um, I, I read the book, as I told you, and I'm a slow reader of fiction. And I read, um, I tend to read more non-fiction, like a lot of blokes, actually. Uh, and, uh, and like Murray, I, I love autobiography. So I read a lot of autobiographies. Um, but I, I skimmed through the book. I really, really quickly, because it was engrossing plot and very convincing uh, and uh, and so I thought well there's lots of things happening in that book in let's say scenarios that you wouldn't you know, normally yourself uh, um, be involved in so can you tell us something about the process um, uh, I once read that Frederick Forsyth who's an incredibly successful author the bit that he likes most about writing is the research clearly you've done a lot of research here can you tell us about that A.A.? Of course, I, I, I've had a lot of help, Michael, um, and I've had a lot of help from two classes of people, really. Some of them specialists like Mary and Prudence uh, and other people who, who explained to me about the DJing world and the clubbing world, for example. Um, and then others are, are people who just love to read. Uh, some of them writers too, but they love to read. Uh, and something like between 20 and 30 people, some of whom are here, um, have read the draft of the book and given me feedback on it. And that means that I haven't just had specialists looking over it and putting me right on issues like police procedure and what it's like to clean a nightclub, but <laughs> I've, I've had readers point out how a book could be made more improved sorry, how it could be improved, how it could be made better, how it could be pacier. I've had readers point out mistakes, uh, not just typos, but um, things like being in the wrong place at the wrong time, for instance. Mm. Um, where's the best place to go, charity shopping in Birmingham, that sort of thing. Uh, it's just incredible what my draft readers know, and I'm really grateful to each and every one of them, because I think the book's good, but it's good because it's a team effort and so many people have helped me make it good. Um, I think my editor, Catherine D'Souza, is here as well. And she's also somebody who can take a book and really make it sparkle. I don't know how she does it, but she is able almost to wave a magic wand and make a book brilliant. Well, friends, if you're looking for an editor. <laughs> Thank you. I shall bear that in mind. Um, and uh, on that positive note, uh, and, and there's also a, another positive note I want to end on, which is to ask Prudence about possibilities for rehabilitation. Young people like Jack with anger problems, anger issues, and also more serious offenders like David. Yeah, well, Jack... Um... Jack was someone that really pulled on my heartstrings actually when I read the first draft and that's partly because I started my career as um, a youth offending team officer before I was a psychologist. So Jack very much is a familiar person to me um, in terms of being the sort of young man that we've, we've spoken about who's had a really difficult time um, and whose journey has taken him from a difficult childhood into his own difficulties. And um, not everyone who has those experiences ends up in trouble. Obviously, that's the important thing to say as well. Um, but for the people who do, I think it's really important that they have an opportunity to turn their lives around. And um, that was one of the things I really liked when I read Bright Lives was, was Helen's um, AA's real um, focus on that. It was really nice to see. Uh, for people like David, it's more complex, I suppose, really, um, in that we have a dual um responsibility to public safety as well as to rehabilitation so that's where uh mary's line of work and my line of work kind of cross over really in terms of working as multi-agency um 
in a multi-agency way so the police will work together prisons will work together probation will work together to build a big picture of someone's risk to make sure that as much as possible we are ensuring that there aren't any more victims in the future and that's the most important thing really with someone like david but at the same time we would be looking at why did david arrive at this point and can we support david to learn new ways of being and new, new ways of living so that his his risk to other people is less Thank you. Thank you. That, I think that's a great note and a great tone to end on. My video has switched itself off for some reason. Anyway, not to worry. Um, so thank you for that. Proof. And so, um, right, we're almost at nine o'clock. So I will say to everyone here, thank you ever so much for coming along today to the launch event for Bright Lies. Um, and uh, AA, I shall give you the last word. Would you like to wrap things up for us? Thank you. That, that would be a pleasure. Thanks everybody for coming along. Um, if your questions didn't get answered, I apologise. Um, I'm very easy to find online, so you can always email me and ask me your questions and I will answer them then. Uh, Donna, I think, is going to post a few last words in the chat if, if she gets a chance, um, just giving details of some of the helplines that people can access if they're concerned about um, domestic violence or sexual abuse of any kind. Um, so hopefully everybody who needs access to those kinds of services will find out that there is help available for them. And I think Mary explained that there are some other groups where you can talk to the police as well. Moving on from that darker subject, obviously, there is darkness in the book, there's brightness as well. Uh, I believe that the book offers hope. It, it, uh, as Prudence explained, it is possible for people like Jack to turn their lives around and deal with their anger issues and rehabilitate themselves. So uh, I'm very grateful to everyone for the opportunity to talk about the book. I hope you all read it. I hope you all agree that Jack and Emily are lovely people. I certainly wish them well, and I hope that you do too. Thanks so much, everyone who's come along, and thank you especially to Michael, Mary, and Prudence. Have a good rest of the day. Bye now. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>